Dane County related to COVID-19 that affect their ability to practice, play and host spectators. The Capitals play at Bob Suter's Ice Arena in Middleton in the USHL. And all of us are, are you know, incredibly disappointed for all parties involved. Um, those are the rules, you know, and we're not going to not abide by them. Um, we just we kind of, at the end of the day, it forced us into a decision, a uh, time sensitive decision that um, didn't allow us to play this season. So that, we're listening to what they had to say in Madison and they, you know, basically what they're saying is we're going to go by the rules. We're going to abide by the rules and really didn't have a choice in this. We, we can't function there in that, in, in those circumstances, which is unfortunate because Madison turned a corner this year. Uh, they revamped, they rebuilt, uh, they brought in a different staff. It was going to look good this year. I'm, I'm confident that, that Madison was in a very good spot and, you know, going in the right direction. Cedar Rapids, totally different story. Uh, our, our situation there is the storm. You know, the storm devastated their building, you know, put them in a real bad spot. And they, that's the news on that. That's not a COVID related. I shouldn't say that it's not completely uh, uh, COVID related. I don't know that. I do know that, you know, they, their business got destroyed. Their, their whole building is destroyed, locker rooms, equipment. And, uh, you know, that's tough to come back from. So, I think because of the COVID situation, it probably made them made the decision easier. We're not going to fight two battles on this. We've got enough of a problem with you know rebuilding our building and trying to adhere to all the standards that have to be put in place, and the travel restrictions and the testing of the of the players with with an ad hoc facility or a improvised facility. Yeah, that'd be extremely difficult. So you've got that going on. Let's let's look at the the scoreboard right now. Uh, if, if we're looking at the uh, in the U.S. Uh, and we're going to talk about the the uh, the OJHL two, you know, out of the Ontario area, but you've got two teams in the USHL, one COVID related, one maybe not, uh, that have opted out. So you know, their their normal running number of 16 teams is down to 14, and if you take the national development program out there, it's 13 teams of players. That are being condensed to. I don't think any of the players from Cedar Rapids or from Madison will uh, will you know, be diverted over to the National Development Program. I, I just don't see that happening. I don't think the National Development Program is looking at that situation and saying, "Hey, we're going to get two or three guys out." They're they're set on theirs. So you got 13 teams now. The North American League is already have th has had three teams. We got Corpus uh, Christi that opted out. We have uh, boy, boy, I got to remember the list now. Uh, we got Corpus, we've got Kansas City, and we've got Springfield this last week that uh, that chose to. Now, all of those, uh, Springfield, Kansas City, and Corpus Christi are, are all COVID-related. However, you know, Corpus you know, was a struggling franchise that's rebuilding, bringing in new people too. So once again, the timing could be extremely good for Corpus in this to come out of this on the other side. So you know, who, who are the winners? We oh, I forgot, the OGHL too, we had the Buffalo Junior Sabres opt out too. Now remember, you know, some people are saying this is because they can't make money at, at all these teams. The USHL teams are going to be dropping because they can't have fans. They're going to be dropping because uh, they, they can't make money on games. That's absolutely true in some markets. But in Buffalo, you know, there is no crowd. In Madison, there's a limited crowd. We're not talking about organizations that were in it for money in the same way. I mean, Buffalo Junior Sabres, you know, their, their crowd, if they get 150, 200 people, that's that's a decent night for a crowd. Uh, depending on what night a week and what's going on in the building, they might get up to two or 300 people. But uh, the, the the women's pro team there, you know, sells out and the Buffalo Junior Sabres get a couple hundred people. So it, it, it's not a matter of them dropping out for any other reason except for the border issue. If you're playing, if you're an American team playing in Canada, you know, it's going to be very difficult. So, you know, that's the scoreboard so far. So let's break this down numbers wise and give you an idea of what this actually means, who wins and who loses in this situation. Because I think that's extremely important to understand is, you know, there are obviously the losers in this situation are, you know, Madison, Cedar Rapids, the Buffalo Junior Sabres, Kansas City, Corpus Christi, and Springfield. You know, in all those situations, they're, they're losing in this situation. Uh, possibly to be able to come back stronger. Who knows what they can do to, to rebuild in the offseason. You know, my money's on most of these programs because, you know, Madison, they own their own facility. They own the building. Uh, I believe they do. I, I, I could be wrong on that. 
Uh, Kansas City, backed by you know the, the Hunt family, Lamar Hunt money. Uh, that's NFL money, so they're in, they're in a good situation there. Springfield, you know, one of the one of the, uh, the the pillars of the North American Hockey League since the beginning. So I'm I'm betting on these franchises coming out of this stronger in the end. Right now they're losers. Right now you can't help it. The players that are veteran players on those teams, they're losing. Okay, they, 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 I can't even imagine if I was a two or three year player on any one of these you know five teams. You're coming into your last year of juniors or your second to last year of juniors. You think you've got it made. Maybe you're going to be a leader. Maybe you're not. Uh, but you're going to get tons of ice time. It's your time to shine. And then the rugs pulled out from under you. It's a devastating blow to those players. Now, the North American Hockey League has already done a, a disbursement draft. They've already put some things together to pull those players back in. And the USHL is already announced, I believe, tomorrow at 3 o'clock. I'm getting reports from several different sources that it's going to happen tomorrow. They'll do a disbursement draft with those players. And each team will get a chance to pick a player until all the players are gone. Or, a, you know, a team could pass too, but I don't understand why they'd pass. And it's basically run a player. So if there's an you know, 03 out there that's got a couple years of juniors left and he was going to play in the league in the USHL for, let's say, Madison, they, he'll, he'll be able to go somewhere else, get a season in, and then he's Madison's rights at the end of the year. Now, maybe Madison makes a deal because the kid really fit in well and wants to stay in a situation. Let's let's let that happen later. Let's not worry about what happens. Know that the USHL is actually doing things to place those players in the USHL. They're allowing the rest of the USHL to actually pull those players in and keep them. So, you know, that's, that's the first thing uh, that's coming out of this that's good. Now, Keep in mind, there's a couple of other things that you, you have to realize. The USHL is at 30-man rosters right now. You know, their their main the, the beginning of the season camps are starting. You know, they're rolling in right now. Everybody's starting the, the roll to get into into gear into into season form. They've got to drop down to 23 now. That the the calendar is different now. I can't tell you when the 23 is. I, I didn't find that out today. If anybody knows and knows what the date got changed to. For this year's 23-man uh, roster, I'm I'm assuming it's going to be you know mid late October, maybe even in the first week of November. These teams have to be to 23 on their roster. So if they have 30, so right off the bat, if you just go through the numbers, normally there's 105 players that don't make those USHL teams that they're on right now. So they were selected in main camp. The rosters are big; they're bloated a little bit. Then those teams trim trim back. So when they trim back. Those players normally aspirate three different ways. Aspirate, wow. Just kind of go like water in all different directions. Now, they, they go to the BCHL, they go to the North American Hockey League, and some may divert to the NCDC. Very few. But that kid will go to the NCDC if he's already got a Division One commitment and he's from Boston or he's already got his D1 commitment and he's from New Jersey and he goes to the Hitmen or he goes to the, the, uh, the, the uh, Boston Junior Bruins. Those kids might go there. Okay, The rest of them are going to the North American Hockey League, especially this year because of the border concerns and because of the pandemic. The winner in this is the North American Hockey League. The North American Hockey League condensed already by three teams. That means those three teams, those players all you know, trickled down into the other 23 remaining teams, so they're already stronger. The USHL players will trickle down will come to now. But now here's the, here's the complex part of this. And maybe it's not complex, but here's the other part that most people don't realize. Even though there's 30-man rosters, some of these players are already double listed. And what I mean by that is uh, you might see a kid that was drafted into the NAL already that already expected to play in the USHL, but he's already been drafted on the NAL team. So he might already be in that mix on that NAL team that the NAL team doesn't even know he wasn't going to show up because he's you know USHL bound. Okay, uh, there are players that that are now going to follow suit to the team they were drafted to in the NAL because their their USHL team either folded or they're going to get bumped out because of the the numbers. All in all, you know, there's the the, the trickle down from the USHL cuts. So if you've got the um, you normally, 105 players are going to get cut normally in a, in a USHL season. Then you've got your, your two teams that are folding that, uh, that have 25 players apiece. Then on top of that, you've got Buffalo, you've got Corpus, and you've got Kansas City, and you've got Springfield. Okay, that's 251 players that are going to get absorbed. Okay, 
Most of that is going to get absorbed into the North American Hockey League because three of those teams are North American teams. The players that were on the bubble that got cut, those, that original 105 that are going to normally get cut, are going to go to the North American Hockey League for the most part. Some might, some might try to go to the BCHL, but that's a tough one this year. You know, players are having a difficult time with the borders. Parents are very concerned about the border there. So I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work, but, you know, the winner, first place, North American Hockey League, comes out of this smelling like a rose. Condensed, stronger, players coming from the USHL that they might not have had before, players coming from the BCHL that they might not have had before. Second place in this, NCDC. Second place, NCDC. They will reap the rewards of some of this, not anywhere near the percentage of the North American Hockey League, but they'll reap some reward out of this. And potentially the BCHL if the border situation uh, clears up because – you know, A, players don't want to pay if the BCHL option is up there and they're going North American Hockey League, BCHL. Right now, the BCHL became a paid league, at least on the short-term, you know, temporary basis. Number two, they don't want to deal with the border issue and they don't want to have to worry about that. And if I was a parent right now, and this is just me, uh, my son did play up in the west, uh, western part of Canada in the AJHL. Uh, you know, hey, that's a long way away for most parents in the United States, no matter what state you're from. And if you know you're going to have a hard time at the border, if there's any concerns, you're probably going to you know, lean towards a, a U.S. bound. Just like if I was a Canadian parent right now and I've got a, a son or daughter that usually plays in the States, I'm really thinking about the border situation. I might still opt to let my, my kid go. But I'm really concerned about that border right now, and I think a lot of parents are feeling the same way on that. So, you know, the winner, North American Hockey League, by far. They, they reap the best reward out of this. They already did their disbursement draft for the three teams that dropped. What's interesting is the players that were eligible when Buffalo uh, decided to make that move, they, that, those players that were actually not 99s that were uh, – 99s that were moving on to college already, but the 2000s and, and younger, uh, they already got absorbed before uh, they were either tendered, drafted, or they've already signed somewhere for the most part. You're already seeing those players pop up in different places. So um, it's interesting to see this all play out. I'm pretty excited about the, the direction of the quality of hockey this year I think is going to be incredible. I think it's going to be incredible in all the remaining leagues – and remember, if there's 251 potential players, now it is, like I said, it's not really 251 because there's a lot of double dip in there. But let's say there's even a couple hundred players there that move into the null. That just means that the EHL, the North American Three League, uh, your USPHL uh, Premier, all those next levels down are all getting stronger too. So this is going to be a great year for hockey. It's going to be a great year to see you know where this all goes. And I, I'm really excited about that side of things. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be an optimist. You know, I'm trying to look at the half full side of this. I'm not looking at the uh, the empty side. And I'm really hoping that this uh, this is a good situation for everybody. So let's see who's on board right now. Let's see who's around. Let's go up and uh, take a look at the list of people. Uh, Flint, Michigan. Jeannie's in the house. Uh, good to see you, Jeannie. Mark is in from Hockey Town. I'm assuming when you say uh, Hockey Town, you, you mean the Hockey Town, which is Detroit. Uh, Potsdam, New York is in. Good to see Potsdam. Uh, Nova Scotia, we haven't seen there in there. We've got uh, Ontario's in the, just across from, it says Greg from, from Amherstburg, uh, straight across from Detroit in Ontario. Uh, yeah, I know most of that Ontario area, you know, every, everything from Sarnia down to Windsor. I don't know where that's at. Maybe you could tell me a little bit. Throw, throw me a note. We got Quebec on the board. We've got uh, Oklahoma. Good to see you, Tim. Thanks for coming on board. Riverside. <laughs> Riverside is our most consistent person. Riverside, California is on there. Luis, good to see you there. Uh, coming to uh, coming home from a Minnesota NAL event or NAPHL event, good to see. Uh, Mary, good to see you coming in too from Long Island. Uh, Toronto's on board. We've got Hagerstown. We've got Albany, New York, Colorado, West Virginia, British Columbia, Chicago. We're everywhere. It's a great audience tonight. Great, great to see you. Uh, Wisconsin, Dells, a little cheese area there too. So great to see you across the board. I got some questions to get to, got some comments to get to, some things that popped up uh, uh, in the last few minutes that people want to talk about. So um, let's let's get into a couple of the, the discussions that some, some of you had. And remember, 
Uh, it's not too late to throw something up if you got a question, a, a general question, not so general. Sometimes you guys answer your own questions on the, uh, on the comment section as I'm talking. I can see you guys going back and forth a little bit. That's fun. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, the other thing, too, is uh, you, you really have to engage. You, you have to get on. Let me know where you're from. Uh, it's great that you let me know what teams you're involved with. If you're playing juniors or you're playing youth, I'd love to know that. And don't forget, go on to the Facebook page if you're watching this on a rebroadcast. Become part of our discussion group. Congratulations to the discussion group. We broke 2,000 people uh, yesterday. That's why I waited. I normally uh, welcome all of our new uh, members on, on Friday. 2,000. Now, I want to just kind of put that in perspective. Four months ago, we had one person. I'll even let you know who that one person is. That one person was Dave Kennedy. And you'll see Dave come on here quite a bit. Has a son that's playing U18 on the East Coast. He lives in Colorado. It was Dave and I. That was it. That was it. And in four months, we've turned this into a 2,000 deep group. Plus, our Facebook page uh, is pushing 4,000. Uh, so we got the phase, we got the discussion group, and then a lot of you are also uh, friends with me. And that is, I don't know how to handle that. That's, that, that group's at 5,000, the people that are, that are uh, uh, friends with me on that. So watching, wherever you're watching, please keep on throwing the notes. Uh, Ray, I see your comment about totally agreeing with the borders closed. And college players opting to stay in, in juniors. This could be the best year of hockey for American juniors for all leagues. A hey, great comment. I fully agree across the board. Oh, Greg came back and tells us that uh, Amherstburg is 15 minutes south of Windsor. Okay, and they got a PAG, PGHL team there. Okay, I think I know where that's at now. Okay, getting south of Windsor, you know, here's a little, here, here's a little uh, tidbit for you. Most of you know the Journey song. Uh, that talks about born and raised in South Detroit. Do you know there's no South Detroit? It's impossible. There's no, you, you know, if you drove straight south of Detroit and you drove as far as you could, what's the first country you'll come to? Think about that for a second. I'll give you the answer. I'll give you just a second to see if you can pop on and tell me. I know Greg's got the answer already. The answer is Canada. Because Detroit sits here and Canada sits here. So there is no South Detroit. So this is, is, as great as that song is, you ever go to a Detroit Red Wings game, they sing that Journey song every single game and the whole crowd sings along and they uh, turn the music off on the South Detroit part. But there is no South Detroit. It's just, just a little, you, know, you, you learn something new tonight, maybe. You might not, you might have already known that too. So uh, let's, let's get into a little discussion. I want to answer a question first that came in. Um, or it was basically a scenario uh, in this. I had a couple coaching calls this week too. And if you don't know about the coaching calls, you know, these shows are all free content, but what I really do on the other side of this, on the, on the, uh, the, my webpage, juniorhockeyadvisor.com is we do, we do uh, paid content. We do webinars for professional coaches. We do coaching calls. Uh, so this was off a of coaching call. I had two different coaching calls were very similar and a few phone calls this week with some other people. But uh, the question comes in and the dilemma comes in and how do you deal with a situation where you're 14 or 15 and you're looking at next season already and trying to figure out how to navigate the, the land? Uh, one option is to play on one of the sp split season teams uh, like the Beast or something like the East. This is more of an East Coast problem maybe from New York East, because New York has the same problem with split season teams too. So you can play split season for a really good team, or at least in a really good league, and you can go to high school and play high school too, and then possibly pick up with your split season team afterwards. So that's an option. Or you can bet the farm and you can go to a prep school, still play on the split season, play on a really good academic prep team, uh, or you can, you know, kind of feather your way down the middle and find the middle of the road where uh, maybe you can find some place like the Selects Academy that has a really good hockey program, and maybe the academics aren't as high as some of the other, you know, prep programs on the East Coast. So you've got options there, and the question comes, you know, what option is the best option for a parent with a 14 or 15 year old in that situation? Well. I, I can't give you a finite answer on this. I can tell you a little bit about, you know, what, what good and what bad can happen out of this. Uh, one is if you're playing in a split season, you're playing in one of the great leagues, 
Uh, and when I say great leagues, you're playing the HPHL, you're playing in the Tier 1 Elite League. Maybe these days, even the NAPHL, the AY, you're playing in the Beast. You're playing in one of the top tier leagues. And I showed you on last week I, on Elite Prospects what leagues they list on Elite Prospects for U16 and U18, U15, 16, and 18. You know, you got to at least be in one of those leagues if you're going to get some kind of uh, recognition for the most part. Uh, and there's, you know, there's lots of options to play 15, 16, and 18. Now, with that said, you know, the, the question is, you know, which is best? Well, the, 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 there's a few things that come into play here. Are you trying to stay at home? Are you trying to stay close to home to play? Uh, are you trying to do this on a budget? Because uh, the budget situation is very clear. If you can play on a high-level AAA team and play high school and it keeps the budget in play, hey, that's a great option. There's nothing wrong with that option at all. In fact, run with that option if it's the best for the family. Because this isn't a, a decision. If you're going to pursue hockey at the elite level all the way up through college, it is not a one-person decision in the family. Little Bobby, little Johnny can't be the one driving the the uh, the, the ship or driving the, the uh, truck on this one. This has got to be a family decision. And it can't be mom and Bobby making the decision or dad and Bobby making the decision. This has to be two parents in lockstep with their player and the rest of the family buying, buying into the process. Because there is sacrifice that's involved with this across the board if you're going to pursue elite sports. Just across the board. The amount of time, the amount of effort, the amount of expenses. It has to be bought in by everybody. It doesn't work if it is not. You know, you run into so many problems, and I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a social worker, but I've been a coach long enough to know that when dad and the son make the decisions and they run this together, the rest of the family veers off and you, you see a fracture and you see a split. Uh, now, it can be repaired, it can happen, but why put yourself through this? Try to get this all on the same page if you can. So the second option is go elite to the prep school with the highest academics, with good to average hockey. That's absolutely a great decision too, if you can afford it, and if academics are that important to you. Some look at the, the, the hockey ages of 15 to 18 as play the best hockey and we get an education because you're going to get a great education in college because you know hopefully money's going to come in or at least you're going to be playing at a in a D3 or D1 level uh, that's that's good hockey but the education's great too but you can't say that's the best option for everybody you know great academics are a good option for the people that want great academics average a a academics with great hockey are an option too and I know I'm kind of you know punting this one kicking the can down the street a little bit but I can't really tell you what's best. I can tell you that, you know, if you're doing the beast and you're playing for your high school and you're doing the highest level possible and, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, don't send me anything telling me that you can't play or spring league's not important. At 14, 15, 16, and 17 years old, playing spring showcases and tournaments are important. It's peer review. It's keeping you on the ice and you're meeting scouts all over the place. They're either coaching your team. Heck, three or four or five of these, these, these prime teams, the guys running the teams are directors of player personnel for the North American Hockey League, or they're involved with the BCHL, directly involved, or the CCHL. And these are people you can easily find out if you go in and look at this stuff. So if you're doing all this other stuff, you don't have to hit on all eight cylinders. You don't have to be at the greatest academic school and playing for the greatest prep team and playing for the best team in the, the tier one elite for a split season and being on the best team for spring uh, tournament teams or showcase teams. But if you're playing on a great showcase team and you're playing high school in a split season, God bless you. You're probably going to be able to move up. Your talent's there. But this is not all about talent. I keep telling you this. Reverse engineer where you want to be. If you want to play D1 for a team in the, on the East Coast, and you know the leagues that are out there on the East Coast, if you want to play for one of those teams, reverse engineer this back and figure out where the best place you can possibly play if you want to get there. Sorry about that. I get talking really, I get dry mouth. Uh, but the, the idea on this whole process is find out what's best for you. So I, I hope this didn't seem like I punted a little bit too much on that one, but that's the best answer I can give you on that. So. Let me, um, let me try to go to a couple other ones. Um, so let's see. 
I got uh, Jamestown uh, Racing and after Jamestown, uh, the null is everyone else has been approved. Uh, the dispersal uh, the dispersal players are coming to teams that have limited space. Well, yeah, yeah, all the dispersal players are going into situations where they still have to make rosters. And let's not let's not confuse this because remember, uh, and you're right. I, I I did hear that Jamestown is kind of still sitting there, but everybody else is is a go. Uh, the Null uh, just announced yesterday that they are going to put their schedule out this week. I think they're going to put that schedule out with a contingency plan in place. Uh, moving forward, but they're still trying to make that deadline of starting their season in October and getting their games going in October. But Ray, your point is is valid. So let me clarify a little bit. This is getting back talking about those teams that folded for the season or you know took the suspended their operations for the year. Those players, let's say they they kept thirty, and I'm just going to use an example of uh, Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi had thirty players that they had coming into their regular season camp at the beginning of the year. Well, first of all, Corpus Christi doesn't even know if all those players are going to show up. First of all, they could have had three or four kids that went to main camp that decided to go to the USHL, NCDC, BCHL, uh, and, and decided to go a different direction. Because you can go places like the USHL and, and go to their main camp and make a team and not go to your null team. You don't have to be traded to make a team that's higher. Okay? And since the NCDC doesn't play under USHL rules, USA hockey rules, I should say. You could also leave Corpus and go there. So, you know, there might be three or four kids on the high end that don't even show up to, to Corpus Christi as an example. And I don't know this for a fact. I'm just using an example. But on the same time, there's three or four kids on the bottom end of that roster that probably are there to fill out the the, uh, the season camp. Maybe they're legitimate, maybe they're not. And what I mean by that is, remember, uh, North American Hockey League has relationships with the NAPHL, and they have relationships with the NA3HL. A lot of times there'll be one, two, three kids that are coming up to go through the beginning of the season for a week or two, maybe get some exhibitions, maybe even get a game or two into the year before they're sent back to the NAPHL or sent back to the NA3HL uh, because they're just not ready yet to be in the North American Hockey League. They're just not the same level as everybody else. So when you say these these players uh, are have limited space, Absolutely. But not every kid is uh, is is NHL or BCHL or USHL ready right now. So you can take of that 251 players, you could probably take at least 10 percent of that number off of kids that were absolutely not going to be on North American Hockey League rosters anyway. They were coming up, getting that beginning of the season experience, going through the training camp, getting a chance to play in an exhibition game, uh, getting reviewed. And then they'll end up going back to wherever they came from. That's a very common practice. So uh, thanks for that information there. Let's jump on and see if I, what else I got here. Uh, what is your voice for a goalie that consistently gets uh, screamed at by a coach and gets called names? Um, okay, so got a question about uh, yeah, how do you deal with a coach that berates? Okay, in fact, th th there's a couple questions about this, and I'm not sure that I'm the best form for this, uh, getting into the conversation about there, there's other forms that might deal with this better. But I'll tell you, you know, how I would deal with it. Um, first of all, anybody that tells you all the way up through U18 that you got to let your kid fight your own battles, you know, uh, that, that's bullshit. And here's why it's bullshit. You know, your son who's doing this for the first time, U18 hockey or U16 hockey or U15 hockey or prep hockey. He's walking in against a man that does this for a living, that's done this hundreds of times, most likely, these meetings. He's got an assistant coach sitting there that's probably done it, you know, a, a percentage of the same amount of time as the head coach. Probably not as much, but in the same so, uh, situation. They've got an agenda, they've got an opinion. And you're supposed to let your son walk into that meeting to deal with this kind of stuff on their own? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. However, there is a hierarchy and there's a way to work through this the right way. The right way to do this is, you know, if you haven't, every parent should find a veteran parent on their team that they can talk to and always blow your information through that veteran parent that's got a level head. Don't find the hothead, the guy in the corner that's throwing his hands up in the air. No. Find that level-headed parent and say, hey, look, I, I, I'm getting concerned. I'll give an example. You know, and th this is a personal example with, um, 
the, uh, with one of my kids. And this was years ago. Uh, I get a phone call from the team manager. I'm not at the practice. And he goes, hey, the assistant coach is taking slap shots at your son. I'm like, what? So I called up another parent that was there. And I said, hey, are you there? He goes, yeah. He goes, you wouldn't believe this. You know, the assistant coach, you know, who was an ex-pro, an ex-NHL pro, I'm not going to use names, not going to use organizations, but I can tell you this. We found out afterwards he was medicated and it, there was issues. However, he was taking slap shots. So I triangulated it. I got the call from the manager. I called another calm parent that said, you know, here's what's going on. So what did I do? I called the coach and I said, we've got to meet. We've got to meet right now. And we've got to talk about this. I'm not going to let my son, you know, fight a battle with a 45-year-old, 55-year-old man. He, at the time, he was, he was in his early teens. That's not a fair fight. So anybody says let the kids fight their own battles. To an extent, that's true. Until there's abuse or there's situations that are happening that are not right. But you don't go blasting in right away. Triangulate. Make sure that your information is correct. Make sure that you're working through somebody else that you can trust that's got a level head to bring you back down to calm. I don't believe in this 24-hour rule you hear all the time because that might not be the right way to handle situations, especially if it's abusive. So my 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 way of handling this situation that, that I just read the question of is I would absolutely find another parent that I could have a discussion with and say, what do you think? Are you hearing the same kind of things? And and work through it that way first before you, you go guns a-blazing and try to work through it backwards on that. So I know I'm a little bit off target on what I normally talk about, uh, but hopefully that that's uh, going to give you a little bit of uh, idea of which direction I go on that kind of stuff. So the next question I see that's coming up is uh, – Hockey academies. Okay, let's leave that a little bit later. I want to get on to hockey academies, uh, and I got some information. In fact, you know what I'm going to do on the hockey academies? Because I saw we had a lot of discussion on hockey academies. Let's take next week, and we'll do a whole show on hockey academies. I used to own one of the hockey academies in the hockey rink. Uh, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. i got a lot of uh, tips. i got a lot of advice, and I've got a lot of people that can help us put a good show together on this. So, the, the situation on this here is let's set that aside. We'll do a whole show on hockey academies. I think we can uh, do a good job with that. Uh, how is a pathway different for a 15-year-old goalie compared to a player who skates out? Well, in many ways, uh, a, a goalie versus a player. Um, all you have to do is go on to my website and go back and grab an article, and I forget what the article's name, uh, the, the name of the article is, but you can see on my um, – on my blog on the uh, Junior Hockey Advisor website, not the Facebook page. Uh, you can see the blog there. There's an article about a player named Billy Sauer, okay? And the reason I bring Billy Sauer up is because I, I, goalies are, are a different breed as far as how they get picked. I've watched numerous times, absolute numerous times, where a goalie will do one thing great and then his whole life changes now, they might do some bad things, and that might not have affected them as much. But unlike a forward or a defenseman that has a great play, that might get noted by somebody that's watching them, a college coach, a junior coach. But sometimes a goalie can do things, and a coach will go, I like that. And the Billy Sauer story is Billy was playing U16 in Buffalo, won a national title with Buffalo. I think it was Buffalo at the time. Uh, I think he was playing with the Junior Sabres. Billy went to the USHL to Chicago. He was actually on a broadcast radio show that, like we're doing right now, and he was, we were interviewing him. I was talking to him. And my former coach, Red Berenson, is the next guy in line. He's, he's queued up. We had two different radio stations, one in Rochester, and the other radio station was in Ann Arbor. Then everything else was blogged or you know, whatever you called it at the time, streamed out. So Red was actually in the studio listening to the broadcast, and went, wow, I really like the way that guy sounds. He sent his assistant coach out. Billy, 17 at the time, hadn't graduated yet. He was playing in the USHL within months, within months. He's committed to Michigan, and he's in a situation where he actually has to graduate early. And it was all because he did a really good job of presenting himself. So a lot of times goalies, there's character issues that coaches look for, positive character issues that stick out for, for a lot of coaches that has a lot that more to do than just making saves. Everybody knew Billy Sauer was a great goalie. He was going to play somewhere, okay? But he stuck out, stood out because he was actually in a situation where he impressed somebody. 
that one moment. And it's I, I say it's more goalies because it just seems like goalies have that one moment thing where they have a flash of their glove. They, they, they make a save and a rebound save, and one of the coaches in the stands goes, wow, that's exactly what we're missing. Bingo, I want to go talk to that kid right now. Not so much with a defenseman and forward zone. A lot of times you get the advantage because you have you know the ability. Now, if you're getting skunked on and you get you let up four goals in a period, that might not be the case. But um, it, I'm not a goalie expert. I don't pretend to be a goalie expert. But you know my experience of watching different people deal with it, a lot of times – the gut feel and the the perception that's developed around a goalie helps quite a bit if they handle themselves really I, I, one of the goalies and their their, their their mom and dad listen to the show once in a while they're one of the first people that joined our our facebook discussion group so if you scroll back you'll you'll see you know the the benarski family uh not the benarski family uh i'll leave it it shouldn't be mentioned their names but one of the reasons he ended up being a d1 goalie is out of our program was because he presented himself so well. He came across so mature. He came across so professional. He got so many things uh, that are just ticked off that coaches don't have to worry about. That helped drastically because there were four or five or six goalies in the league that were just as good as he was, but he presented himself well. So there's so many more things that with goalies because remember, goalies are on an island. People want them to have thick skin. They want them to be professional. They want them to be hardworking. And a lot of coaches don't know how to deal with goalies all the time. So they want to make sure all those things are taken care of so they don't have to worry about it as much. So I hope that answer helps a little bit. I'm not really sure if that's, uh, if that's what you wanted to hear, but uh, let's see it. So Bradley says kids need to know how to have his back, that you have his back always because hockey is only a brief second of his life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm not saying you got to fight every battle for your kid. I'm not saying you should be going in there and arguing about ice time. I'm not saying you should go in there and argue about what line they're on. No, 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 no. I don't want a mass you know, exodus from this show and people going, ah, oh, we're going to go out there and tell that coach what we think. I'm not saying that. But if it's abusive or there's a perception that it's abusive, then the adults have to get involved. Period. Period. There's no argument that if it looks like it's abuse, you step in. Okay, you might want to work through the parent, like I suggested. You might even want to get the team manager involved. Depends on what the severity is. But there's lots of avenues for this. And there's a travel director involved if you need to go that route. So you know, once again, talk to a parent on the team first. Get yourself grounded. Make sure you're not steaming off on something that's you know trivial. But if there's real abuse there, you got to jump in. And you got to jump in hard. So we had another question that came in, and this was about billeting and it was very similar uh billet player is asked to do all the dishes for the family billet player is sleeping in substandard conditions compared to everybody in the house uh billet player is just not getting uh even a level playing field as far as how uh, his experience is with his family and the billet the, the family the, the the player's family his parents are afraid to say anything because A, they don't want to rock the boat. B, because of the COVID situation, they don't want an investigation start that's going to, you know, where some kind of governmental operation comes in, you know, local social services or whatever, looks at this family and says, what is this whole billet thing? And then blows open the whole billeting in the area because it's kind of been, you know, this, I don't want to say it's a uh, best kept secret, but you know, billeting is not something that now USA Hockey does a good job of making sure billets are, are screened, background checked, all that thing. I'm not worried about that, but I'm not sure all billeting is uh, fully recognized and uh, understood by, you know, both local, state and federal governments. Let's just put it that way. So the, the, the question came up, what do you do if, uh, you know, once again, maybe slightly abusive situation, at least the player is being taken advantage of. If he's doing you know, chores and he's doing dishes and he's, uh, he's fending for himself in the house and it's not an equal representation with even the other family members uh, and he's looked at that and he's paying a billet fee on top of that, you know, the team's got to get involved. You, know, you, you have to bring that up. You, you can't uh, not bring that up. Now, you know, you, you, you risk the situation that that might not be the billet family you live with. That's a risk you got to take. You can't go a whole year if it's if it's semi abusive or abusive, you just can't go a whole year. You got to say something. You know, you got to move on. Now, one thing I can tell you with lots and lots and lots of experience, I've been a billet host as a uh, as a uh, involved in junior hockey, where I've billeted you know 
dozens of kids over the years. I've had both of my kids out of country billeting and in country billeting. You know, both of them went up to Canada and they billeted in the United States. Um, you also got to give it a little bit of time because if somebody's homesick, a player's homesick, sometimes that story is embellished a little bit and sometimes it comes back into the, the, the norm or the, it falls back within the mean. So make sure you give it enough time to make sure the story is real and you triangulate the story because you don't want to upset the app, apple cart if there is nothing that's going on. There's also a coordinator. I think somebody just put a question up there and said there is a billet coordinator. Absolutely take advantage of the billet coordinator. But once again, you can't r- brush this under the rug. Uh, yes, there is a risk that the team says, hey, you know, you, you're, you're a rotten apple and you're, you're a problem. That's probably not going to happen, though. That happens for the kid that is a problem, okay? But if you're a kid on the team, even if you're new on the team, there's no reason for you not to step up, uh, stick up for yourself, and that is going to need some parental help, the billet coordinator help, the assistant coach, the general manager, and the coach. You, you have to get into that hierarchy and let them know. There's somebody on the team side. There's the billet coordinator that works with the volunteers for the, uh, for the billets, but she also talks to either the general manager or somebody in the front office or the coach himself and connects. you got to make sure all those are connected. So I hope that helps a little bit, um, and we'll go from there. Um, let's see what else is coming in here. First of all, we're blowing up tonight. We've had a great audience, one of our biggest offices of the year. Uh, Candy says the best thing to do is speak to the billet coordinator. Absolutely. Thanks for putting that on there. Scott Dale's in the house. Uh and then Candy also says, we've seen this in our associations. Uh, we've got one comment that came in. Typically, what is the youngest age that scouts, colleges, or juniors uh, are looking at players? So great question. Typically, what is the youngest age that scouts, colleges, juniors are looking at players? Well, the scout category is a subjective category. What is a scout? Because uh, there are scouts for the brick tournament up in, in, in uh, Edmonton every year, and those players are 10. There are scouts for the U-12 Pee Wee Quebec tournament, and that's a 12 tournament. Uh, there are scouts that work for the, uh, the selects organization that scout for their, the WSI and different events that are 12, 13, 14, 15 for the European team. So, and there are scouts that work to put together tournament teams uh, at 10, 11, 12. So let's take the word scout out for right now and just look at the junior and the college ranks. So what ages do junior coaches get out there and start looking at players? Well, uh, if you're talking about major junior, USHL, BCHL, they start young. Uh, a player can be on the USHL radar from central scouting or from a general manager or the director of scouting. 13, 14 years old, the USHL will start looking at. Now, the North American League, the EHL, uh, the NCDC, they, you know, unless they know of a kid that's local in the area that – you know, they're, they're watching just, you know, because he's in the area. They're not out and they're not reaching out into the community like the USHL and the, the majors are. Then the major three are, you know, the Quebec League, the, uh, the OHL, and uh, the Western, uh, uh, Western Hockey League. So those programs will start young. The NHL will start young. The NHL will watch kids at a very early age. All you got to do is go to Boston and you go to the, uh, the New England Sports Center and go to one of the major U15 events or major uh, U14 event uh, and, and look at all the uh, NHL coaches that are up there. Most of them are older and just there because they get uh, you know, some per diem for being there. But a lot of them are legitimate. Uh, the other thing, too, is you go up and you watch the U, U15 event, uh, the um, OHL Cup, and watch those teams play. You know, it's, it's just chock full of uh, all the major junior teams, a lot of NHL presence, D1 presence, and there, there's also um, USHL presence there, but you don't see uh, the NAHL, you don't see the other ones up in those areas. So um, the answer is, uh, yeah, you're getting looked at at the elite, elite level at 14, 15 years old. Okay, when you definitely jump into U15 and you're playing elite at U15, you're getting looked at. Uh, you're, you're looking at kids in the HPHL, the Tier 1 Elite, the Beast, they're getting looked at, okay? And they're getting looked at in many different ways, uh, to see if they're heading towards major junior, to see if they're heading towards the USHL, and uh, the the next level down. If you're not a a USHL level player, remember, there's only 16, and now you know there's only 14. And take away the national development program, there's only 13 options inside the USHL. If you're not a USHL level kid, 
and that's not where you know, your talent is. You're the next echelon down. You might not look, get looked at till you're 16 to 18 years old, okay? Because if you're playing in the North American Hockey League, you might not really get a set of eyes on you till uh, you're in your second year in the North American Hockey League. You might not get a set of eyes on you in the EHL because the EHL, the Eastern Hockey League, they deal mostly with D3 players. Okay, they're going to get scouted, but somebody's not going to spend time looking at a kid that's in the EHL that's got three years of junior eligibility left because they know that he's not ready. They're going to take, remember, D3 programs take the oldest players possible, period. That's the way it works. You can go look at all the rosters. You know, the, the vast majority of players going to D3 hockey have ex exhausted all their time in junior hockey. So if you're in the EHL, you're probably not going to get really looked at seriously looked at until your second year or your third year in juniors just the way it works so hope that helps on the question about when you get looked at let's see what else we got coming in here uh i run a defense camp uh, for u11 that runs almost year round i run on ice and off ice my question is how old should kids uh, be before they use video training well f great question Owen. You're, you're training kids how old should they be before you start using video well, if they're at 11 and they've played video games on TV, they're ready for video. Okay, and what I mean by that is if they're playing NHL and an 11-year-old possibly is playing NHL, I know my son at 11 lived the NHL game. They understand more conceptually than you think. They know the angles. They know the systems. They know how to put pucks off the glass and get it out of the zone. They understand icing, offsides. They understand how to make moves on players. I would say that at that age – they're probably already a lot further and more advanced than you can. I don't think you can break down stride biomechanics, but you can look at them and give them one or two points. Used to do it all the time when I was a private lesson instructor, even with younger kids in 11. Uh, and I would start off with saying, look where your stick at. Your stick's flying all over the place. Let's get that stick on the ice. And then showing them a video again of what it looks like and comparing the two afterwards. So absolutely jump right in with video. Uh, it wouldn't be elaborate, one point at a time. You know, it, but it absolutely works that age, and you'd be a, a surprised at how advanced kids are at that age. They just absolutely know a lot more incredible amount of information than you expect because of the fact that they play video games. They play the, uh, the NBA games. They play the soccer games, uh, World Cup, and they play NHL. And because of all those games, they understand how to, you know, how to handle a two-on-one. They understand triangulation. They understand passing so much more than you would expect them to. So I would jump right in on the video side and, uh, and see where that goes. Um, the other one is uh, some parents say it's all for fun and it's not too serious. And I can't, I can't help you if your parents uh, have a mental attitude that um, it's, it's all fun, it's all fun, it's all fun, uh, and don't want to push. That's not my job. I tell, I tell people that if you want to be in the all fun world, it's not, you know, playing in the Tier 1 Elite League. It's not playing in the HBHL because uh, it is fun, but there is a certain amount of time and effort that needs to be put into that so you can have fun. The game of hockey should always be fun, but it doesn't mean you don't have to go to bed on time. It doesn't mean you don't have to eat right. It doesn't mean you don't have to you know, work hard in practice and work hard in games, which comes with you know playing at elite level hockey. If you're playing in a house league, Hey, you can come in, slap on the gear, go out and play and have a great time. So if parents, you know, you know, one of the things you hear all the time and institutionally we're, we're told this is all about fun at the younger ages. Just keep in mind, if Tiger Woods had that attitude, he'd be playing putt-putt till he's 14. Okay. If Serena Williams had that attitude and the family had that attitude, she'd be playing ping pong till she was 16 years old. Okay. In the basement. And that's not the case. So there is absolutely a certain a part of being elite that needs a nudge from parents. It doesn't mean you need an iron fist, but you need a nudge. You need to make sure they go on bed in time. They got to get up at 6 a.m. for those 6 a.m. practices. You know, all these things come along with being an elite hockey player. So it's not just the kid. The kid can't wake up and say, I want to have fun today. And the parent go, okay, he just wants to have fun today, so he's not going to practice. Johnny says that he's bored of hockey right now. Hold it. You got a commitment. You got to commit to it. Now, when the season's over, that's when you and Johnny sit down and figure out if elite hockey is still the, the avenue. Because if he's getting bored halfway through the season and doesn't want to go to practice, now every kid, every kid is going to go through two or three times during the year where 
you know, they, they just absolutely don't feel like hockey. Hockey seasons are long. They, they, let's, not, let's not get lost in that side of things. But at the same time, you know, if you see your kid veering off the path, you can't shove him back on the path. You work with him to keep his commitment, even at the youngest ages, and then at the end of the year you reassess. So that's a good question on that. Uh, I hope that helped a little bit. Uh, New Brunswick's in the house. Thanks. Uh, let's see what we got for another question here. Would you recommend more prep schools in Canada or in the States? That's a great question, uh, Felix. Uh, you know, prep schools, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of set that aside till we talk to academies next week because Canada has some great hockey academies. And I'm going kind of, to kind of explain next week the difference between an academy and a prep school and what are the hybrids that are in between because you've got – pure academies and you've got pure prep schools that both have hockey and then you've got the in-betweens, you've got the hybrids in between. Okay, so we'll talk about that next week. We'll get rolling with that and we'll see if we can uh, clarify that a little bit for you, Felix. So wait for next week. We're going to do a whole show on that. Owen, I'm glad you like that. Okay, Dylan, let's see what you got. Minnesota high school hockey, triple-A hockey, elite divisions, high-performance division. Should a high school player play while high school uh, season is not going on uh, with these leagues? Okay, so Minnesota is a complete animal in its own. Uh, for those of you who don't understand Minnesota high school hockey, Minnesota high school hockey in a couple pockets. There's a little bit in Michigan. There's a little bit of pockets in Boston. There's a little bit of pockets in, uh, in Wisconsin that have elite, elite high school hockey. But for the most part, you know, in the state of New York, you're not moving out of high school hockey without playing in an in elite level uh, AAA hockey, split season, whatever it is, and moving on to the next level. Okay, in Minnesota, players can get Division One commitments right out of high school. So it's a different beast playing in Minnesota across the board. And this is not just for what Dylan's saying. This is across the board for everybody that doesn't understand Minnesota high school hockey. It, the, the whole state, their districts are built on the school districts for hockey. So think of your school district, wherever you're at in the United States, your high school district, you know, where you got your elementary, your middle school, and your high school, and you've got boundaries on that. That's their hockey boundaries for their youth hockey programs. So Minnesota is able to develop players that stay in their system all the way up through. They move up from six, seven, eight, all the way up through high school. And they're playing baseball together and football together and hockey together all the way up through. So it's a different model. It's a different beast. That's why when USA Hockey went to the, the whole uh, AMD model, uh, ADM model, sorry about that, American Development model, and they started talking about this, Minnesota was reluctant. They're, they they were a rebel on this at first because they're like, hey, look, we already got this. We got this. We already produced the amount of players that we produced that's better than anybody else. We are already put, kicking in the most people into the NHL. Uh, Division One, NHL, uh, USHL, you name it. We've got the most players, so why do we need to move into this ADM model? Now, they met in the middle, and it's, it's all better now. But one of the byproducts in the last 10 years are some of the Minnesota schools, uh, be, the kids that don't play uh, fall sports, some of these kids, Minnesota's opened it up. So I think there's about 10 programs now that are AAA split season. And if you go to my hockey rankings and you look at 15, uh, 16, and 18, you can see those Minnesota split season teams and they're out there and is it a good idea it once again it's 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 relative to what your needs are if you feel that playing on those teams are are, are necessary absolutely play on the team uh, if you're playing fall sports already and you're you've got a great team and the t team produces players and puts them up to the next level high school hockey that is puts them to the next level and the majority of the, the players are playing fall football or they're playing fall sports, maybe it's soccer, and they're still going into the hockey season and they're still getting the ability to move up with that team to the next level uh, to play juniors in college. But there's no reason to play on that split season team. Those split season teams do get recognized. Those split te season teams do help players, usually from markets in Minnesota that don't have the, the limelight because even though, you know, the overall picture in Minnesota is phenomenal for high school hockey. It is the best high school hockey in the world. You're still going to get programs that don't get the same limelight. And so if you can make one of those teams, and those are virtually all-star teams, we know that, those 10 teams, and you can play on one of those teams and get a little more exposure, that's great. But I wouldn't do it if you've got the ability and everything's lined up. And a lot of these, uh, the kids that play on these teams, 
don't have the opportunity because their their high school team is either weak or or just is obscure compared to the the uh, the rest of the leagues and the rest of the teams. So I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, remember, uh, a lot of these teams will in Minnesota the high school teams, even though they say they're not starting until November, a lot of those kids are skating on their own. Uh, even while they're playing football or even while they're playing uh, you know, soccer, they're still getting in skates so they're ready for the season to go. So uh, that's, a, that's a great question, Dylan. I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, the, those leagues are absolutely legitimate. They're absolutely great uh, to get involved in, and it's a good idea to get involved in them, uh, and I do that as much as I could. Um, so the question, Felix, is uh, do you have a lot of knowledge on the hockey in the Quebec area? Uh, in relative terms to junior and above, yes. Uh, to, as far as youth hockey goes, uh, I, I really don't. It, it's, uh, it's not a, a specialty of mine to know the youth side. If there's something, Felix, you want to DM me on specifics, you know, shoot me a DM. I'll see if I can help you with it. But uh, I really don't know the youth market that well uh, in, the, in the Quebec market. Uh, it's just not something that uh, helps. Dylan, I hope that helps you. I see you say thank you there. But I'm not sure if I hit that as, uh, as hard as you wanted me to. Um, that's about it for the night, folks. Uh, I hope this has been healthy, helping you all. I hope you had a good night tonight. Our numbers have been phenomenal. Uh, this is twice the audience we normally get live. I've told you this before. As we grow these, these broadcasts, you know, we're reaching now uh, thousands and thousands on the, the replays. Uh, and the numbers are, are getting better every week. Uh, it used to be when I got 6,000 people watching a video, I'd be like, well, that's pretty good. And now it's like, okay, we got 6,000, that's, that's fine. You know, but th we still struggle on the live audience. And, uh, but you know, we, over the course of the night, we'll get probably uh, 300 people. Uh, but tonight it looks like coming on and off, we'll have a much bigger crowd than that. So um, it's been a great night. I've really enjoyed talking to you about this. Thank you so much for the interaction. That interaction is what makes this work. Remember, if you're not a member of our Facebook discussion group, jump on to the Facebook discussion group. Become a member of that discussion group because not only am I there, but there's 300 professionals in the industry that are on that site too. Uh, they're, they're, uh, there's plenty of parents that have already experienced things that you're going to go through and they're there to help you. That Remember I talked about finding people that have been through certain situations? Find people to talk to in our discussion group. It works. That's what it's there for. Hey, our Facebook page needs some love too. So if you can go over and like and follow us on our Facebook page, Junior Hockey Advisor, I sure would appreciate it. And don't forget, you can always go to our website. Coaching calls, I, I'm spending a lot of my week now uh, doing one-hour coaching calls with people. And that's where I spend an hour discussing whatever you want to discuss. I am not a family advisor. Most of my calls are dealing with how to navigate the world moving into family advisors, how to hire the proper family advisor, how to structure yourself in the right way. So if you want to jump on, you can enroll right off the website and get a coaching call set up with me. That's a little bit more detailed. That's a little more intimate, and it's one-on-one -on -one and private. I don't uh, share those discussions with anybody. And then any of our webinars that are on there, uh, if you're an industry professional, you can look on there and you can see uh, some very detailed uh, uh, structure that can help you uh, and build your career. So hopefully this helped for everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I'm seeing some people. Uh, I, I can't get to anybody else tonight because I've already promised my wife that I was going to get off at a, a decent hour. So once again, this is Jeff Colson from Junior Hockey Advisor. Thank you, and we'll see you next week when we spend the night talking about academies and hybrid academies, and we'll spend a lot of time going into a lot of detail to help people in those markets so you understand what they're all about. Thanks. Have a great night.